<laughs> oh boy. Well, Murphy's Law, whatever. <laughs> That's why you come in here, isn't it, every week, just to see what kind of goofy <laughs> things I'm going to do. Really okay. Huh? Really entertaining. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And notice Beth is not here to be entertained. And when she sees this, she's going to say, what happened before, <laughs> before that? Okay, I forgot to turn the camera on, folks. We're talking about the timeline of Scripture here. So let me get this down. Um, the book of Job is the oldest writing in Scripture, um, predating the Torah, uh, which is Leviticus 23, as in Moses' writings of the Torah. But in the book of Job, Job 19, oldest scriptures in existence, presentation of the Messiah, the resurrection, and the, the second coming of the Messiah. Uh, amazing. In fact, also, not only the resurrection, but a new body. He said, even after a worm, the worms completely consume my body, in my flesh, in a new body, I'm going to see God whom I will see for myself. Personal salvation. I mean, it, uh, it's just what he said in that verse. I, I preached a message at my friend's funeral from, from two verses, those two verses in Job. And it just blew me away what God said to human beings through Job. Right in the middle of all, like Pastor said this morning in Brent's prayer, in the middle of all of our sufferings and stuff, such awesome things happen and God speaks to us in such an amazing way. Which is what blows my mind about this, because um, from 450 B.C. on, the Jewish people say these were the dark years or the silent years. Because they say God wasn't speaking for about 400 years. Um, but look what he had done before then. Uh, I've had people say to me, um, why doesn't God give the Jewish people dreams like he gives the Muslims nowadays? I said he did. Look in the Bible. Hello. Book of Daniel. Uh, book of Genesis. I mean, God was speaking to his people, speaking truth to them. They weren't, you know pizza visions when you eat something at night and it doesn't agree with you and you go to sleep and have crazy dreams. These were revelations from God. So Job gets his revelation from God and writes down. So even before the Torah is written, Job's writings are circulated among the people. And then Moses writes the Torah and it says exactly the same things, especially when it starts uh, his listing in Leviticus 23 of the Feast of Israel. Uh, you look at the Feast of Israel, they have to do seven of them. They have to do with the perfect life of the Messiah, which is also going to be pictured later on in the Feast of Hanukkah. It talked about the death of the Messiah, a death for sin, the resurrection of the Messiah. So this is the Feast of Passover, an unleavened bread where the, where the bread is broken, uh, the Feast of Resurrection, which is first fruits, uh, and then you've got 50 days until the Feast of Weeks. And the Feast of Weeks is awesome because the Feast of Weeks is about salvation. This salvation that's pictured in the first three feasts is available for everybody. Um, Jew and Gentile can come together in one body. So that's what the Feast of Weeks was all about. Then you've got the long summertime period. Feast of Trumpets, which has to do with the coming of the Messiah. And then the coming judgment, which is feast, which is the Day of Atonement. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the kingdom, the millennium. They can't see that because of this. No, this is the stand. The stand is in the way. Oh, oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right, can you see it, Rick? Lean that way. <laughs> sorry. Okay, that's all right. I'm going to do it like this. I hope nobody gets motion sickness watching this video. <laughs> okay, but look at this. So all of these pictures, beautiful pictures for the Jewish people, and they've got everything that Job said. They've got so much of Scripture written, 
in, in Ezra and Nehemiah, which is right around in here, they take out the scrolls and read them. And God begins to, to, to break their hearts about the beautiful picture in these feasts. And then uh, Purim, the Feast of Purim happens right before the closing of the revelation of Scripture. Well, and I'm sitting there this morning thinking, what's the timing of that? Here's the timing of it. God knew what was going to happen. They're already under bondage. They've already been taken prisoner by different kingdoms, more than one. And they still are in bondage when the Feast of Esther happens. And they are still going to be in bondage all the way up into these dark years because in the middle of it, in 165, when Hanukkah happens, they were under King uh, Ahasuerus. So uh, they've been, they're going to be captive of these pagan people for a few more hundred years. So God gives them a miracle right here, preserves the people during the Feast of Esther, Purim, and says to them, you're an everlasting people. You're not going to be wiped out. No matter what has happened in the previous 200 years, uh, the captivities that were happening, the Babylonian and the Persian captivities, what's going to happen in the future when um, Ahasuerus comes in? Uh, you are, I'm going to keep my promises to you people. You are my eternal people. So right before the darkness, Malachi writes some amazing words in, in all four chapters, especially chapter four. And Malachi, the last revealed words before these dark times are about the coming of the Messiah again. And he says, before the Messiah comes, a messenger is going to come and announce his coming. And Jesus refers to Malachi and points to John the Baptist and said, this is who Malachi was talking about. This is also who Isaiah was talking about, the one who would come and make a higher road for the Messiah to come. So <clears throat> all of these warnings and pictures, and then right before the lights go out, I say, uh, another miracle that says, hey, I'm going to keep you. I'm going to keep you. But the cool thing about this feast, the Feast of Purim, is that this was the primary fulfillment of it, but I believe the picture that it was, the thing that it was picturing was the flight into Egypt. We're going to talk about that after the birth of Christ, back in, in on up in December. We're going to talk about where he was born and the fact that the prophecies in Micah chapter 4 have specific words after the words about the Messiah being born, specific words about him and his family fleeing into the wilderness. It's amazing. There's no secrets. God keeps saying, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. If you believe it, here's what's going to happen. Now, <clears throat> sometimes the advantage that, that they had was that it was written. And all you had to do was believe it. Now, we have a little bit of a disadvantage here. Okay? We can't understand why people can't believe this stuff. But we've been around it all of our life. And everybody in here has multiple Bibles. And the average Jewish person has never owned his own personal Bible. Um, amazing to think of the difference between our mindset and theirs. I mean, this is so clear to us. It's so easy to understand. We can see these pictures. I had a Jewish uh, friend say to me one time, I know that you think you know what this means. I said, no, I know what it means. I said, you're the one who only thinks he knows what it means. But I said, my understanding of the meaning of all of these feasts comes straight out of your scripture, which I am willing to believe. And God wants you to believe if you will just ask him for the faith to believe it. Now, when um, it's interesting here that Purim is all about the word deliver. And we're going to look at, at uh, we're going to look at Daniel in just a moment and see that 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 word just keeps popping up. It's a Chaldean word that is in exactly the equivalent of a Hebrew. 
but it's talking about exfilling or evacuating somebody out of a dangerous situation. Remember what Nebuchadnezzar said to the guys? Who is able to deliver you from my hand? And the, the crazy thing is that all three of the Chaldean um, kings that we're going to talk about, they keep throwing out the word that to the Jewish hearing would have been Messiah, 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 deliverer, 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 who is able to be the deliverer, who can deliver you from my hand. Well, we have a deliverer coming. Okay? And uh, if he decides to deliver us now, that's okay. But he may not. But he is going to deliver us. And they could add, just like Job said, he would deliver us. So, and hang on. I just got to click this button and we may have about five more minutes. <laughs> okay. I had it plugged in all night. I don't know what happened, but all right. But partway through, partway through the darker silent years, which the Jewish people say ended with John the Baptist. They say that he was a prophet of God. He was in the right uh, tribe. He was the son of Zacharias, who they considered a prophet. So they say the 400 years ends about the time that John the Baptist came on the scene, which was around the 30s AD. Well, 165 plus 30s is 195, which is almost exactly half of the 400 dark silent years. So that's why I say God's timing of giving this miracle of Hanukkah right in the middle of the 400 dark years was not only to shine light on them and to remind them, and we're going to get this in two weeks when we go back and look at Isaiah. I believe Isaiah prophesied this miracle that was going to happen that became one of their feasts. Now, the feasts were seven plus Purim is eight plus Hanukkah, which is nine. They celebrate nine feasts today. But these two, remember, these two were added on later than the ones in Leviticus. And the reason they were added on was with a purpose, okay? They needed to be reminded right here that God was going to keep his promises to deliver them. And then shortly after Purim happens, <coughs> the Babylonian uh, kings start using that same word. And then you get up, on up into the book of Daniel, and the book of Daniel is all about the Messiah. Daniel 9, yeah, Mark. You may have, and I may have said it wrong. <laughs> the Jews believe the dark years ended with John the Baptist. That, yeah, approximately, yeah. Okay, so what was the light? Was it what John the Baptist said, or what terminated the dark years? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. And that's, that's just what some rabbis say. If you, have the, if you ask the average Jewish person, just person in the synagogue, they say, well, we've heard about the 400 dark years, but we don't. All we know is that <coughs> with the last writing of Malachi, it seemed like for quite a, a long 